Dr. Sherry Berger here for this week's Holohan's Hot Topic. I'm here with Dr. Melissa Holohan. Hey, doctor, what are we talking about this week? So this week, we're actually going to be talking about toxic, um, toxicosis, and particularly presumptive canine toxicosis in 19 dogs. So background, um, cocaine is a, the second most problematic illicit drug globally. It is a psychostimulant drug, and it actually accounts for almost 50% of human ER visits, um, those visits that are specifically coming in for drug use. So unfortunately, it's a pretty common abused drug. Um, and it, overall, because of that, it's going to be one of the more commonly seen in our canine and sadly, in some cases, feline patients as a toxicity in our emergency rooms. The cocaine itself is extracted from the coca plant leaves. Um, it, it can be inhaled or injected. Specifically, the crack form is the smokable free base form. However, all of these forms could be potential exposures to our canine and feline patients. So the objective of this study, because there hasn't been any previously reported data, was to characterize dogs with presumptive cocaine toxicosis. They wanted to look at the incidence, the signalment presenting complaints, the history of these patients, as well as clinical signs, if there was any specific laboratory test results that may lead us um, closer to a, a presumptive diagnosis of cocaine tox toxicity, complications, treatment, as well as hospitalization and outcome. As I think these are important things that we need to be telling our clients up front um, if it's a patient that has a good survival probability or in some cases a negative um, survival probability. So this study was done as a retrospective over the course of 2002, uh, two, so 2004 to 2012 at a university veterinary teaching hospital setting. They did find 19 dogs total that not only had clinical signs consistent with cocaine toxicosis, but also a positive urine cocaine test. Overall, neurologic abnormalities appeared to be the most overrepresented. In particular, these patients presented with bilateral mydriasis or dilated eyes in 58% of the cases. 53% were hyperexcitable or hyperesthetic, and so these are patients that may respond um, a little bit more exaggerated than the average patient to any touch or stimulation, whether that's vocal um, or whether it's um, you know touching the patient. About 50% cam came in with the signs of ataxia as well as muscle tremors, and then there were some patients that show the opposite of hyperexcitability -excit with mental dullness, and in some cases, 16% had seizures. Other signs that they noted during this study was weakness, vomiting, lethargy, which are pretty nonspecific signs. However, some of these cases also had a sinus tachycardia, hypertension, as well as hyperthermia. The only two laboratory findings that appeared significant in these cases was 21% had, had the presence of hyperglycemia and about 50% had an elevated plasma lactate. However, I think that there may be several reasons why the lactate was high in these patients. Most likely it may be related to seizures, tremors, hyperexcitability um, that may be causing more of a type B hyperlactate. Um, in those patients. However, I think further research needs to be done to look at that aspect. Uh, but it was interesting to note that over 50% did have a high lactate at presentation. Hospitalization of these patients was done for a median of 15 hours. Uh, the range was 10 to 30 hours. Again, I think this is important for our clients coming in that we can say about 24 hours potentially um, where we see a good resolution of clinical signs and we're able to transition them home. Treatment included largely supportive care, with in crystalloid fluids, sedation or anxiolytic medications for those patients that may have been hyperexcitable to the point where they may be hurting themselves, um, and the use of diazepam or benzodiazepines um, such as midazolam um, were also evaluated. Um, some patients did have acepromazine given or chlorprazazine, which are sedative medications. And those medications in particular are good medications to evaluate, evaluate in those patients that may be presenting with hypertension or high blood pressure. Acepromazine is a nice medication there to try to um, combat that clinical sign. Anticonvulsants were used in those patients that presented with seizures. And then Esmolol was one of the medications evaluated for those patients with sinus tachycardia. So any beta blocker could be used. Esmolol is an ultra short acting beta blocker, and so that is the nice thing about that drug because, as you can tell, the median 
time of hospitalization was very short, some of these patients may not have a sinus tachycardia for very long. So pulling a drug like uh, propanolol off the shelf that may last a little bit longer may not be the most appropriate. So um, certainly something you could evaluate, but Esmolol was used in this study when they looked at it retrospectively because of the short-acting um, mechanism. The most important thing I think of this study is that all dogs that presented with confirmed cocaine toxicosis survived. And I think that's a big thing to educate our clients about, that if we can support them um, aggressively, we can um, get them to survive to discharge, and that was an overall good survival rate. The conclusion of this study was that cocaine toxicosis, although infrequently suspected, uh, may be commonly confused with some of our other toxicities. I think probably one of the most common ones that comes to mind um, is marijuana toxicity. Certainly those dogs can present with neurologic signs as well, um, and there can be cardiovascular changes noted, both bradycardia and tachycardia in the presence of uh, marijuana toxicity, but I think there's a, a lot of overlap there with many of the illicit drugs that we're seeing um, that are coming in with our cats or dogs being exposed to them. So I think it's important to put this on your differential list when evaluating uh, those potential toxicity cases. Hospitalization is certainly recommended in these patients, not only for monitoring and supportive care, but as you can see from the reports, there are some life-threatening complications that can occur. And so if you have a patient that presents only a few hours after ingesting or being exposed to cocaine, um, you may not see seizures for 12 hours out or potentially a hypertensive crisis and tachyarrhythmias that may need to be treated if, the, if severe enough. So I think it's important, again, educate our clients that these are the reasons why we would recommend hospitalizing these patients, even just for a short period of time, to make sure that they don't um, develop these complications. So overall, again, cocaine toxicosis uh, has a great prognosis with appropriate care, um, and I think that this is something that I would keep on your differential list when seeing patients that present with neurologic signs that are unexplainable. And I think that we as veterinarians, since our patients aren't able to give us a good history, making sure that we prompt our clients for appropriate exposure to these drugs if we see a patient that has neurologic signs or cardiovascular signs that are unexplainable. And that's all this week on Hollihan's Hot Topics.